I want to thank the CSL music team for the great music today. And of course our reader for doing such a wonderful job of that excerpt from the essays. We're starting a new 13 week series today on living the science of mind. And each week is independent. I hope that you'll make as many of them as you can and catch the other ones during the week sometimes. This week we're doing an overview of living the science of mind. It's a book of essays that are essays of Ernest Holmes where he wrote them to explain the teachings that he wrote in the science of mind. Ernest Holmes is our founding father and I find these essays easy to read and interpret a lot easier than some of the chapters in the science of mind. So I'm hoping that you'll get the book and read through it with us and if not just come and enjoy the messages for the next 13 weeks and get a little bit more insight into our philosophy and what we stand for. Our focus this week is in an overview and exactly how Holmes saw the science of mind, our physical and our spiritual natures, how we are being on this planet. But first, the question of the week, what's the one choice that you can make today to know that it is done unto you as you believe, to think affirmatively, and to keep the passageway of your thoughts open to the divine flow of good. One more time, what's the one choice that you can make today to know what is done unto you as you believe, to think affirmatively, and to keep the passageway of your thoughts open to the divine flow of good? I said that this is a 13 week series and some weeks there's more essays on the reading list than others. And for a list of each of the weeks, you can download the series overview from our website. So let's get started with exactly what it means to be living the science of mind. In the opening essay, we read this. The science of mind is an outgrowth of the spiritual faith which people have had throughout the ages. Before science was conceived, the presence of God was felt. Before ever mental actions or reactions were analyzed, history was filled with instances of men and women who had experienced God. Men and women who had experienced God, and it had nothing to do with all of the analyzation that we do today. Holmes went on to speak about harmony in the law. This science necessarily starts with the proposition that we are living in a spiritual universe whose sole government is one of harmony and that the use of right ideas is the enforcement of its law. We are living in a spiritual universe, one of harmony. We just don't always stop to recognize that or to believe it. In his later writings, Holmes actually referred to the two basic concepts that make up this philosophy, love and law. And today we can see how love and harmony really go hand in hand and are somewhat synonymous. It's difficult to have one without the other, isn't it? I think the most revealing words in his opening essays were this. The science of mind is a reinterpretation of the universe by a process of thought which Jesus used. We learned that there is one body, the body of right ideas. Jesus sensed this body of God, which includes man's body, as a perfect, harmonious unit. And he realized that the evil which binds man is not a principle within itself, nor a thing of itself, and most certainly not a person, son, but merely a false system of thought. He understood that his knowledge of good annihilated that which denied good. This fundamental fact that he clearly brought out in his teachings, the truth 
known is followed by the truth demonstrated. So there's quite a bit of meat in that quote. First of all, that the evil which binds man is merely a false system of thought. Think about that for a minute. Evil is a false system of thought. It's error thinking. And the truth known is followed by the truth demonstrated. How often have you heard me quote that phrase of Jesus that it's done unto you as you believe? As you believe. Holmes wrote about this phrase. When Jesus said that it is done unto us as we believe, he implied that there is a power that can, will, and must react to us. But this power has no choice other than to react to us in a way we think. No other choice but to react to us in the way we think. So how do we today step into knowing the truth so that that truth can be demonstrated in our lives? How do we go about annihilating everything from our thoughts which denies good and therefore embracing our own good? How do we start thinking in a way that when the law reacts to it, we're bringing about our own good and good for everybody else? Holm consistently tells us that only as much good comes to us as we can conceive. That's a, one of our fundamental teachings. Only as much good comes to us as we can conceive. So how much good do you want to conceive? How much good do you want showing up in your lives? I know I want oodles of it. So it's up to me to annihilate any of those thoughts that deny my good. And that means thinking affirmatively. How often have you heard me quote this quote of Holmes? There is a power for good in the universe greater than you are and you can use it. There is a power for good in the universe greater than you are and you can use it. I believe that down to my very core. And if you embrace this philosophy, you most likely believe it as well. So why do we not use it more often or more effectively? In the reading today, you heard that we are all united with a creative, invisible force, and this force reacts to our thoughts. And we heard that Jesus reminded us we have to believe that when we ask, it's given. That's why that song about our thoughts or prayers is so important. Every thought that we think is putting something out into the universe, and it's coming back to us. So. How do we go about knowing that we are moving from this creative, invisible force, that we're allowing it to flow through us? Is there somewhere in that process where perhaps you fall short? Something that blocks your flow of good? The reading told us that the idea seems so simple that we often overlook how powerful it is. I love that Holmes likened our thoughts to images held in front of a mirror. If we truly examine our thoughts every day, how might we make changes? Perhaps it's time we really start looking at our thoughts. Perhaps it's time we stand in front of that mirror. Mirror, mirror of my thoughts. What am I bringing about? Yeah. There are two other key points in the section on thinking affirmatively. And I think that it's important that we look at them. Our thoughts are either silently attracting good to us or repelling it from us. And the other one is we can change our thinking and change our lives. Both of those are important concepts to embrace. If we believe that it's true that our thoughts are attracting or repelling our good, wouldn't we want to be more careful about those thoughts so that they actually attract our good rather than repelling it? 
The interesting part is that most of our thoughts are unconscious ones. A lot of them we adopted at infancy or thoughts that we never truly examined. Some we took from people we trusted and others we developed because something repeatedly seemed to happen in our lives and so we developed a belief around it. Perhaps even some of our self-talk is about our unworthiness or not being good enough. It's time to start examining those thoughts and bringing about more good in our lives, examining the thoughts and deciding if they're ones that we still truly believe. Anyone with me on that? I bet the third concept actually pans out when you start changing your thinking. I'm guaranteeing you that if you change your thinking to have more positive thoughts, your life is going to change. If you start truly believing that good is coming to you, more good is gonna to come to you. We can change our lives by letting go of things that no longer serve us. And we need to lift up our thoughts to do that. Truly embrace those compliments from our friends. How many of you actually really take in the compliment and appreciate it? and actually mean it when you say thank you, or don't dismiss it by saying, oh, it was nothing. How about those things that come from deep within us and we know that there's something that we do well. We cook well, or we help others well, or we are a good friend to people. The things that we know are our gifts from the divine. I invite you to notice exactly the part of your life that is the essence of all the good that the divine has instilled in you. And notice when you start paying more attention to that, if your life actually does change for the better. My guess is it will, but sometimes it takes an effort for us to have that happen. Learn to take your thoughts captive. Focus your attention on the reality, on good, on just, on the pure, on the things that bring joy. Stop and smell the roses. Enjoy those awesome moments of life that we might just pass along and not really stop and pay attention to. And start with the little things. Here's an example. The next time you're feeling tired, instead of saying, I'm tired, say, I could use a little bit more energy. It might be amazing that what you've asked the universe to give you is more energy. So instead of getting more tired, you actually have a little boost. Or here's another one. Instead of saying, I don't have enough time or money or whatever to do this, that, or the other, say this. God is my source and all in my life is in divine order. God is my source and all in my life is in divine order. Or how about this? I'm in the right place, right where I'm supposed to be. And when you feel like you're struggling, turn it over to God. Let God do it. Holmes was a great believer in prayer. In this philosophy of the science of mind, we call prayer spiritual mind treatment because what we're doing is treating our mind to the truth so that we really can step into our spirituality. I know you've often heard me say one of my favorite quotes is this, there's nothing to be healed, only the truth revealed. When we place on our minds on what we know to be the truth, healing does occur. When we let go of all the things that we worry about or all the things that are really not the truth or we just made them up in our minds, then our body can start healing those places that are creating negative energy because of all those beliefs. What I know is that no matter how things appear to be, no matter what it looks like on the outside, in this human life, that God's in it somewhere. 
I bet you can finish this phrase for me. There is absolutely no spot where God is not. If we believe that, then we can let go and let God. We can release things so that we don't have to handle everything. We can let God do it. You know, there's a bunch of falls in Colorado as part of the Rocky Mountains. And all of those falls actually come from this base of water that flows way beneath the surface. And it's that water that flows beneath the surface that makes all of these falls so absolutely beautiful. Some of them are more impressive than others. Some of them the water flows abundantly and other ones not so abundantly, maybe just a little bit of a trickle, but it's a beautiful fall. When we actually look at all those fountains that are coming from that same source, what we know is that there's a deep subterranean level that flows and each of those fountains is coming from that. Each of those fountains is supplied by this one body of water and it gushes up, having that pressure be so that these falls make part of this beautiful valley in the Rockies, just gorgeous for people to look at. And the waterfalls, I think, are a great example of how nature reflects life. Holmes likes to liken it to our spiritual nature. We as individuals each have our own thoughts, feelings, hopes, aspirations, and desires. And each is directly and intimately connected with the one divine life, energy, and power. Each of us is a fountain of life. There is a God pressure back of each one of us, a life force seeking outlet through our thoughts and acts. There are many fountains, many individuals, but only one God pressure back of all of it. Imagine if we allowed our thoughts to focus on the God pressure that's back of each of us, that life force that's seeking an outlet through us, through our thoughts, through our acts. Can you see how that might have us focusing more on our good? Are focusing more on our thoughts that there is one life that's God's life and it's our life as well are focusing on how to just relax into that God pressure to sustain us and move us through anything that appears difficult those fountains in the Rockies don't think about oh well what if the water source dries up oh well, what's gonna happen to me if if the water source isn't there any longer they just flow consistently because the pressure is there from deep within. It's a beautiful analogy, I think, to think of the fountain of God pouring forth from each of us. Each fountain in the mountain is of itself nothing, but it's dependent on the pressure that is back of it. And each of us is a fountain that depends upon the God pressure back of us. Our good works come from the divine. It's when we take time to listen to that still small voice within us that we know exactly how to move forward in life. It's those small nudges that help us reach our full potential that allow us to overcome difficulties and see the potential gift in them, or that allow us to monitor our thoughts so that we bring about our good and allow that flow of the divine good to wash over ourselves and others as well. So this series is about learning to step fully into being all that you can be, learning to know how to use that creative life of which we're all a part. Learning to take hold of our thoughts and direct them in such a way as to bring about our good. Learning to let God do it when it's not ours to do. 
Holmes put it this way, each one of us is an inlet to the divine, but because we are individuals, we can inhibit its flow, we can block it, or squeeze it down to a small volume, or even stop it. Or, by opening up all the channels of faith and conviction and hope, we can increase its flow. When the natural joy of life is unblocked, it will flow freely through us, and we shall become whole and happy. But doubt, fear, uncertainty, anxiety, and a sense of insecurity can so congest our mental life that nothing good can get through. We are born with a natural desire to express life. So what I know is I want to fully express life. I want all those channels of good to be flowing through me, all that joy of life to increase my joy. And so I'm inviting you to let go of the doubt, the fear, the uncertainty, the anxiety, that sense of insecurity and do what you are born to do. Have that natural desire to express life fully. So in summary, decide this week to truly live the science of mind philosophy. Reinterpret the universe. Remember that the truth known is followed by the truth demonstrated. And there is a power that can, will, and must react to each of us. And then remember to think affirmatively. Mirror, mirror of my thoughts. What am I bringing about? Take your thoughts captive and focus on good. And also, let God do it. Remember the God pressure that's behind your fountain of life. It's a life force that's seeking an outlet through your thoughts and your acts. Allow it to do that. And if things are difficult, just turn them over to God. So here's your affirmation for the week. How is it that I so easily and willingly know it is done unto me as I believe? Think affirmatively and keep the passageway of my thoughts open to the divine flow of good. So I wanna challenge you this week to pause a few times each day and just notice your thoughts. And if they're focused on good, great. And if they're not, Shift them so that you can focus on something good. Let it, whatever it is you're worrying about, let God have it. And focus yourself and focus your thoughts on something good so you can bring about more good on the planet. We want to live in a universe that's filled with love and laughter. And we do that by managing our thoughts and focusing on that fountain of good that's the God pressure flowing out through us.